What you're about to hear is chapter 2 of my story, Apocalypse Awakening. However, it is chapter 1 of part 1 of the book. I've split the book into three parts, for reasons that will hopefully become obvious later on. So the chapter from last week was more of a prequel to the grander story that's about to take place. Don't worry, you're still in the right place. This is a continuation from last week's episode. I thought I would just clear up any potential confusion before I began. With that being said, Apocalypse Awakening. An unconventional narration. Part 1. A New World. Chapter 2. Not a good day. Dead. He must be dead. Then how could he still... Michael lurched forward and slammed onto the floor, water cascading around him. He spluttered water from his mouth and gasped desperately for air, whacking numb limbs against stone. A harsh light struck him and he covered his eyes, turning onto his back. Howling filled his ears, cold air whipping his skin. He kicked and pushed himself across the floor until his back propped up against something hard. Something metallic. He sat there, cowering, hands over his face, with knees drawn, waiting for whatever came next. Nothing happened. Water trickled, drained, and settled while the howl petered to a prickling whisper. Michael slowed his breathing as he listened, but there was little to hear. He leant against the metal using his back which only seconds before had been destroyed underneath all the armour that he no longer wore. The suffocating noise of battle and the thick hot smell of jungle. The gunfire and the crushing rocks. Where had it all gone? A chill seeped through his feet and rear, touching the hard floor, especially at his back, pressing against the cold metal. Michael had just enough sense in his numbed body to realise he was naked although not a hint of dampness clung to him. Where had all the water drowning him disappeared to? Even more bizarrely, where had it come from? Could this be torture? Maybe the rebels had defeated the battalion and captured his wrecked body, waiting before waking him. Some interrogator would be standing over him, directing a cruel smirk at the pitiful sight curled up before his feet, preparing to hit with whatever... Defrosting complete. A woman's voice. He hadn't been expecting that. Defrosting? Surely that couldn't have meant him, treated like a slab of meat shoved in the freezer to stop it from spoiling. A draught carrying the chirping of a bird brushed against Michael's ears, making his skin shiver and pimple in protest. He hadn't felt a cool breeze like it in weeks. He began to open his eyes, from lines to slits to wedges. Michael flinched as a rock fell near his feet. He took a deep, calming breath and sat forward, squinting at the misshapen rock where a stick protruded from its centre. Rocks tumbling and birds tweeting in an interrogation room? No, there was no torturer, no table, no glaring light bulb, not even a wall. As his eyes adjusted to the blurry grey stone, Michael realised he lay in a cave, light streaming in from its mouth. Too weak to walk, he crawled onto his front, dragging himself across the ground and ignoring the small scraping rocks against his torso. His hand scrabbled against the surprisingly flat floor and he used his fingertips to gain leverage as he dragged. Stones jabbed at his exposed sides, and Michael swore as he squirmed and yanked across the floor like a one-legged spider. The edge of the cave suddenly dipped away, allowing him to grip the ledge and pull. He finally collapsed, panting at the edge. He turned to face his reward. Grey skies, grey seas, grey giants, all layered against one another in a bleary, looming blob. Michael closed his eyes, shook his head, and let his breathing catch up. Knew it was important not to get panicky. The images would make sense, eventually. He wasn't going to let a set of blurry eyes get the better of him. He looked again, 
and this time the ships took form. The skies were blanketed in thick drab cloud, blocking the sun's vain attempts to break through. The shifting sea that stretched below was moving, not from a current, but by wisps of mist and fog. And the giants were no more than great boulders, jutting from the ocean of fog, some half collapsed and leaning against each other for support. An urge rose to run from the alien world, but Michael refused to let it grow. This didn't make sense, and he'd promised himself to never panic until grasping the full picture. Still, it was hard not to be overwhelmed. Where were his allies? How did he end up here, completely alone? Even some enemies would have been a comforting sight. He began to look back from where he'd came, away from the craziness swirling outside. Saw the rock that had fallen from above. Only now did his eyes see it for what it really was. A chunk of concrete with a sheared off piece of rebar protruding from its middle. He craned his neck and saw the ceiling above, half crumbling, half missing. Not a cavernous roof of rock, but a broken floor of plaster and linoleum. Now he was truly baffled. Michael's eyes finally focused. Outside of a room's shell lay not an ethereal forest of enormous rock stacks, but the destroyed ruins of a city. A vast one of vacant skyscrapers towering far above, and their not-so-lucky brethren dashed across the streets below. He gripped the edge of the floor and glanced over the side. Directly below Michael lay the contents of the next room, but when he dared look out further, he was greeted by the far drop. He looked across the street and saw his reflection staring back in the windows of an obsidian black tower. He lay in the middle of a gash in the building where the rooms had been torn open and exposed to the wrecked cityscape. The ruined walls mirrored the dozens of surrounding buildings down and across the street. Each one had been damaged in some way, from gouges ripped through windows and steel alike to half-collapsed towers struggling to stay upright. The destruction was so fearsome that some buildings were utterly demolished, leaving piles of debris in their place. Michael's own room had suffered during the long dead chaos, a giant rip left in the floor. The once gleaming monuments of glass and shiny metal were now grey and dilapidated. The only bright things Michael saw were the green vines and trees, lots of them, permeating throughout the destruction. Everywhere he looked, nature took its stranglehold covering lower parts of the buildings and spreading higher and large green veins on a quest to reach the topmost parts of their new kingdom. A pack of dogs barked from the heart of plant-clad streets below, thick with grass and scattered trees. That worried Michael more than anything else. How long had it taken for all this vegetation to grow? There was no city, at least none he knew of, that had been allowed to fall into such disrepair. How long had he been... What had he been doing? Michael rolled over and looked back at the contents of the room. Facing him were three metal cabinets, tanks, standing guard by the far wall. Only the rightmost one remained intact, a dark grey chrome box that quietly hummed to itself. The tanks were each big enough to fit a man inside. In fact, that was their purpose, for within the left tank sat a dried-up skeleton, glowering at him with empty eye sockets and a hanging jaw. Michael realised he could have easily been in its place if whatever had opened the other tank finished the job. A bad ending for sure. The metal tank's metal doors, which he'd leaned against moments ago, were wide open. A cool mist wafted, and a white liquid dripped from the bottom of the tank, seeping through cracks in the floor to the room below. Michael must have been submerged in the liquid while he'd been asleep. Had he really been frozen? Michael tried to stand, and ended up on his knees as he crawled over to the right-hand tank that was still closed. The dark metal had a brushed shine, a unique tinge he hadn't seen before. Black cables trailed from the ceiling to the gently humming tank. There had to be a third person frozen inside. Michael stretched out his hand and touched the metal. He yelped and fell back as an alarming sting ran through his palm from the severe, penetrating cold. He held up his hand and saw an ugly red and white mark already beginning to form there. Michael gritted his teeth, furious at his own stupidity, but this was not the time to dwell on it. Most of his palm had been burnt, and he would need to find warm water, quick, to submerge it in. Then he could... Ah! A searing pain shot through his body as he collapsed onto the floor. 
writhing on the concrete and arcing his back as invisible needles stabbed every inch of him. Michael yelled, swore and kicked wildly into the air, unable to find the source of the torture. The painful sensation ripped through his torso, down his arm and to his right hand, concentrating on the burn. He struggled to hold back the tears, gripping his wrist as tight as possible to try numb the area. Was that steam coming from his palm? He couldn't tell as everything grew dark. The pain vanished as quickly as it had come, and Michael gasped in relief as he returned from the brink of passing out. Through teary eyes, he saw his hand's normal, fleshy colour completely healed. What he was sure from harsh experience would have taken weeks to heal had done so instantly, at an excruciating price. Now he was back to square one, lying naked on the ground, gasping for breath. Damn, he said, hitting his freshly healed fist weakly on the floor. It had been a miracle all right, but one that only left him more confused. Michael sighed and lay back, ready to sleep. A horrible thought stopped him. It was almost as if another voice entered his head, a faint, reminding whisper. Where am I? With the question lodged in his mind, he couldn't shake it. Michael lay still on the floor, staring at the cracked ceiling. Stayed like that for a long time, thinking. The Alliance. Finn. What could have happened to them? Nothing. Nothing in his memory explained this. Fighting for his life one second, and the next? Teleported? Frozen and reanimated? Nonsense. The words, defrosting complete, they must have come from the freezer. But who put him in there? Why release him now? A cold draught hit Michael, and he shivered, bringing him back from his musings. It was hard for a man to properly reflect without any pants on. The sun was low in the sky, and the temperature worse off for it. His first concern should be survival. Nothing's ever achieved waiting for something to happen. You have to find the solutions yourself. He sat up and looked towards the doorway. A skull stared back at him. A second one, attached to a skeleton, sprawled on the floor. Blaster rifle lying centimetres from its bony fingertips. Michael didn't have the strength to be surprised. Of course, there would be other corpses. Ones probably responsible for the destruction everywhere. Cloves hung off the skeleton in several places. Good. Michael would need to cover up against the cold of the night. He stumbled over to the corpse, legs at last strong enough to support him, and examined the cloves. They were rotting and pieces of fabric fell apart in Michael's hands as he tore the trousers off. No luck there. The only thing somewhat intact was the jacket, protected from the once rotting flesh by the vest underneath that had taken the brunt of the decay. Michael snatched the jacket from the skeleton, scattering bones across the floor. He ripped off the disintegrating collars, and used the sleeves to wrap the jacket around his waist. He supposed he'd cover his most vital area, if nothing else. He glanced at the boots, then his own feet. Could tell just by looking that he was many times bigger in size. There was no use in staying here. Time to move closer to the ground and begin his hunt for answers. Food! That too. Michael must have been hungry enough that he imagined his stomach faintly talking to him. Wouldn't be the most surprising thing that had happened today. All that was left was the rifle. Rust cascaded from the metal as Michael picked it up. It had the similar, bulky shape of a blaster rifle, but any other details were long past discerning from this piece of crap. He tossed it over the side and listened. It took a long while for the thud to come back. It would take some time getting down. The room's only door was drop-barred on his side, but Michael didn't want to take that for it. Those bars were probably the reason he'd been left alone for so long, and there was still one more occupant in the freezers. He could come back for them later. For now, he'd drop into the room below and find a way down from there. Michael took a step forward and froze as a glint of light caught his eye. It came from the arm of the skeleton that had rolled across the floor, from the bracelet attached to its wrist. Michael rushed to the spot and knelt, cold sweat springing to his head. He liked to think himself a man you couldn't shake easily, but this, this... 
Slowly, he pried the bracelet from its owner. An emptiness spread through him, but that didn't stop him from feeling the lever in his hand. Stark contrast of black against his palm, the metal band in the middle standing out clearest of all. Michael looked from the bracelet to the corpse, the name Conway burning bright in his eyes. Today was not a good day.